The Cary Grove area has a unique and colorful history, but what of the town's prehistory? Before and after earliest man arrived on the scene, great natural events took place here to shape the appearance of the land. On first examination, it seems there are no clues to Cary's prehistory, but they are here just the same. The first settlers were the Native Americans, and they settled here because of the Fox River, the prairies, and the woodlands, and its abundant wildlife. I have several pieces that I found in the Cary area. This is the oldest piece, dating back 10,000 BC. I have a piece here that's Marion Thick Cord Pottery that was authenticated by Dr. Robert Seltzer from Beloit College in Wisconsin. The interesting thing here to archaeologists is that it uh, shows that the Indians didn't come here just for the summer months. They also were here for the winter because this was a large piece of pottery. And that's really a nice piece to have and it's the largest piece that has been found in McHenry County. Okay, I have some scrapers that they scrape the hide. I have an axe, an old, old axe. This was like a hammer stone used like we would use a hammer today. Uh, there were some that were used for balls. The Indians did play games, marbles, uh, a wonderful knife. This piece was my most recent find and this was just found on the, down on the river banks just like a couple of weeks ago. It's just the piece at the bottom. But you can see where the hide was tied around here real tight. Another interesting piece that was found just recent was I first found this piece this spring. After a rain, if you go after a rain, it's interesting because things will come up. If, for instance, if a motorcycle has ridden along a, a trail, they will pop up and then the next couple of days I found the other piece to this, which is really amazing. Uh, I've got some tiny, tiny little pieces from probably that the Indians did when for the children for something for them to do. And to me the most awesome thing is to think and hold something like this and think 10,000 years ago someone worked and made this piece and I'm holding it today. Native Americans, pioneers, farmers and entrepreneurs have all contributed to the area's rich heritage. Early settlers in Cary and Fox River Grove were drawn by affordable land and an opportunity to start a farm on which their families could subsist. My grandfather was born in the Czech Republic and he came to Fox River Grove in 1903. He was a businessman in Chicago in the, in the, in the wood business and uh, Mr. Old Patterny who had the picnic grove was a friend of his and he came out one day and he said, Joe, why don't you buy this farm over here? So my grandfather in 1903 paid $8,500 cash for an 80 acre farm in Fox River Grove that consisted of 20 cows, three horses, some chickens, and some machinery. My grandmother was furious. He was a man who was probably a woodman, was getting involved in being a farmer. The farm ran between River Road and Grove Avenue from the river to the new school, and that was the Vorasek farm. The Harper family came to carry by Ross's Bridge. My folks bought a um, land out there from uh, the Rawson farm, or it wasn't that name, but Nell Nellie Thompson owned the land, and we bought a lot for, from him. And the, my father, the first year, uh, we camped in a t tent. And then my father, that summer, was building a garage, two-car garage. So by the next year, we had a two-car garage to live in. And then my father started on the house. And uh, but we only used it for a summer home. But we were out here almost as much in Cary that we were in, in Chicago. We were all born in Chicago. And uh, we liked to ski and ice skate, and the boys liked to hunt and fish. And so every time we had a chance to come out here, we came to Cary. While no known photos exist of William Dennison Cary, we know that he was born in 1808 in Sandy Creek, New York. He first purchased land in this area in 1841 and planted Cary Station in 1856. Mr. Carey built a two-story red brick home at 9 West Main Street in 1845. Today, the home's actual address is 2 East Ross Street. William Dennison Carey died in 1861. He did not see the Civil War end. 
My husband was a direct descendant of Cary, and they came here as settlers from the east. I have uh, an original, what they would call a blanket chest, that was brought over by a covered wagon. I have that, and that was in the 1800s. Luna Mensch was the first school teacher and principal in Cary. And the building, of course, is now known as Windridge Funeral Chapel. It was one room. All the children were in this particular building. I have the original bell. And you have to realize that back then, uh, the children were from grade one to eight, but also the fact that when harvesting time came, or planting, a lot of the children had to work in the fields, so then they would miss school and come back the next season and repeat. Sometimes the children were 16 and 17 years old. This belongs to William D. Carey's first child. It's a christening dress, all handmade, the tatting, everything. These are the little gloves that were worn, most unusual for today, and the little kid slippers, and this, and this hat here is all hand tatted. Now this is 1847. This is the original teacher's register book where Mr. Luna Minch kept the records of department, the attendance, and what have you. And this is the original school bell. As the 19th century gave way to the 20th, the people of Cary and Fox River Grove shared many rich and colorful experiences and saw much change through the good deeds of the famous and the misdeeds of the infamous. Then, of course, the crash came in October of 29, so things were very tough in Cary in the 30s, and we were, we were a very poor town, very, very poor. There was no place to um, work for my father and the rest of them. The only pl three places in town to work were the Northwood Make Farm, Hertz uh, Farm, and a few people worked at Frankie Lumberyard. Uh, my dad, fortunately, worked for um, Mr. Hertz who was a very, very tough man to work for. He, he had his uh, homes here in Cary, he had homes all over. He was the fifth richest man in the world, and not just in the United States, in the world. He made his money, uh, he started the yellow taxi cab. He painted a couple cars yellow in Chicago and started with that. By uh, 1936 or 37, he owned Studebaker, he owned TWA, he owned the Arlington Racetrack. Uh, he won the Kentucky Derby with Ray Count, and, um, late 20s or early 30s, and Ray Count Stable is still up here on, uh, in Trout Valley. Mr. Hertz was quite a celebrity when he came into Cary, and he bought a, the land, which is now known as Trout Valley, and um, he raised horses, which were, ended up to be quite famous in the Kentucky Derby and things like that. He had many celebrities come out here, and of course one of his sons married Myrna Loy, which was quite a thing for Cary to have a movie star. The River Bend has a long, colorful history. Even though we moved here in 48, that was probably the first year it was really a restaurant. Prior to that, it was simply a bar. In fact, in the 20s, more, more popularly known as a speakeasy, where all the mob members from Chicago would come out and play. This was their playground in McHenry County. This was secluded in a gravel road out in the middle of nowhere. It was a small, square little bar, but the inside was filled with slot machines. In fact, I have worked with um, a lady uh, many years ago who did tell me she came here as a teenager. She described the bar to me and the slot machines were everywhere, in the basement, in the foyer, in the bathrooms, in fact. The Grill was kind of a, a resort town. It was known for me a playground area. There were always big picnics coming on Sundays in the summertime in the picnic grove. And um, you couldn't cross Lincoln Avenue in those days unless the, the police was, was blocked traffic. And of course, in those days, there was a lot of gambling in the county. I can remember we had slot machines in the grocery stores and the restaurants. And our favorite, we also had one in the drugstore. And, um, we come home from a scout meeting or somewhere and we put our nickels and dimes in the machine and hope we have a windfall. One time, uh, oh, it could have been in the 40s, the, uh, Bill Washer, uh, who was on uh, maybe 15 or uh, 12 Spring Street, 
he had Washer's Tavern, and they had slot machines and so forth. And uh, some of the gangs from Chicago, I guess, wanted to uh, get part of it or do something. But anyway, they threw a bomb through the front window of his place and blew most out of the, blew most of the windows out of all these uh, first block here in Cary. It was at, late at night, and so nobody got hurt. On the corner of Lincoln and Route 14, it was kind of a big entertainment center for adults. So it was a dance hall pavilion in a tavern called Louis Louis Place. The dance pavilion was also a place where they had wrestling matches. And I recall as a young boy in the 30s going to see those wrestling matches. And two of the local heroes were Jack Spurling and Ray Riswold. Now in the tavern, downstairs, once I got to see oh, this, there was the famous tunnels. There were two big white doors down there, and they opened up one door and showed my dad and myself the tunnels, which led somewhere back into the residential area. How far they led, I do not know. They might have been 100 feet, they might have been 20 feet, I do not know. But they led back somewhere into the residential area of town, which would allow an escape for a bootlegger. A lot of um, hoodlums and so forth uh, came to carry in the late 30s and 40s. Uh, um, just about, uh, about a half a mile from where we're talking, they uh, raided a truck one night on the Z curve up here and uh, took all their booze away from them. There was a still up by the corner of Three Oaks Road and 14 just across the highway that was uh, raided when I was in about uh, fourth or fifth grade and uh, they didn't catch the guys that were doing the stilling because uh, they had a tunnel out from the barn out into the cornfield. They got away from them. Uh, but they wrecked the still, of course, and everything. And then um, down on um, Hickory Nut Grove Road, right near where I live, uh, was the Lions Farm, and he was always had his fingers in a lot of things. And he had a barn there, and um, my dad always told me the story that, that they would uh, go there from John Hurt's farm to buy some horses from him. And he had a blind horse, and that horse would run down the middle of the barn, and he, he knew where to swerve, because there was a hole in the barn floor where the still was hid underneath. And uh, they never, never did catch him, though, but he was a big one in it. And then, of course, um, in the early 40s, um, Roger Tui, they were, uh, they were chasing uh, him, and they thought they had him cornered in uh, Fox River Grove with Cernakis, but there also was a tunnel out of there. It's uh, right on the corner of um, where the stoplights are in the Grove. There was a big dance hall there, and he got away from them. I'd never seen so many state police in one town. And then... Um, uh, Babyface Nelson uh, got it uh, when they went after uh, Al Capone up in, uh, or um, not Al Capone, John uh, Dillinger up in Wisconsin. They all scattered, and Babyface Nelson got caught right outside of Barrington on the curve there. And uh, my dad used to show me the gun marks in the tree where they'd uh, gunned them down. It, it was, uh, there were some thrilling times. While some of Chicago's most notorious crime figures made the Cary Grove area their playground, so did many of the country's most prominent business leaders and philanthropists. Well, my great-grandparents came here and uh, purchased some land. I think it was from the Indians. And uh, as time went on, my grandfather bought the land from his father and uh, encouraged, uh, started uh, encouraging people to come out to Fox River Grove and he had a picnic grove, a hotel, and a dance pavilion, and uh, he, he would have all these picnics in the picnic grove. And he had a surveyor come out and start laying out some property and encourage people to come out and buy these to start Fox River Grove. Well, it uh, goes back to my father-in-law, Louis Cernaki and his mother and father. They came out and had a restaurant in Fox River Grove. Very nice restaurant, very good food. Good Bohemian food. Dumpling, sauerkraut, duck, everything. And they had a dance hall with a great big, all I heard about was this big, big chandelier, crystal chandelier. Supposed to have been just beautiful. Maybe mm -hmm. you it was, saw it. Yeah, I saw it. Just beautiful. And of course, my father-in-law worked for them and then afterwards, after he and my mother-in-law were married, they uh, had a liquor business. And then they bought the property from the Grand Old Patterny, and we ran the picnic grove. 
which was in 48. 42. 42. Yeah. And from those picnics, they went into Seaburg jukeboxes, uh, the gas company. We had large groups. Bell and Howell, a lot of big, big 